One Foot Flipper. Hi, Paige here, the One Foot Flipper. How's it going? I'm okay. It is late Saturday morning, and I got myself up at the crack of eight to go to garage sales. Yeah, I know. I'm lazy. Other people will get up at five and be trying to get to the sales at six, but I just wasn't feeling it at 5 a.m. Plus, the only sale that I saw signs for said it opened at eight anyway, and I don't really feel like I have to be there first anymore. But anyway, so there's a sale, and they have signs all over town. I mean, for miles out from their house. There must be 50 or 100 signs. All the signs have balloons on them. You know, huge signs. And so I get to the place. Well, it's not the smallest sale I've ever seen. You're basically talking about the sale consisted of what was in a single wide driveway, about a 15 foot section on each side. Very, very small. Basically a few skinny tables, some furniture, and a rack of clothes and a bookshelf. The rack of clothes said all clothes, $5. Since I don't look at clothes, I didn't care about that. But I started looking at the rack of books. There were some hardcover Stephen King books there. I'm thinking, well, at least this isn't a total bust. I pick them up and I glance up and this bookshelf, which mind you is mostly crammed with paperback books, many of them fad diet books and other things like that, that nobody would ever want. This bookshelf is labeled all books, $5 each. I set my book back down and I turn around, hobbled out and thank the people for letting me look at their stuff. Oh look, I was fidgeting with this part and now I broke it. Now I have to delist this part. It was $10 and now it's nothing. I'm honestly a little bit bummed my Former roommate and best friend Josh, who I haven't seen in about 12 years, he was seriously injured over the weekend, and he's going to be okay, but that just really has me down. It just got me remembering how much I miss the guy and how I'm never going to have those single days in my 20s back. So, Josh, if you're watching this, I hope you get better soon. I sent some messages to you through your sister. Hope you get them. But otherwise, in the last few days, I've been thinking about the concept of the install base. And what I mean by that is that you want to be aware of how large the market is for things you are selling. This could be for individual items, such as, you know, this screwdriver. Install base for this screwdriver is pretty much universal. Anybody could use the screwdriver. Or it could be for huge lots of items. It could be for selecting your specialty. You might not want to pick a specialty that only one person in 10,000 would care about. Like Japanese market Game Boy games. There is a very unhappy seller on eBay right now who has selected that as his specialty. And he's very unhappy with his specialty. Because nothing sells, particularly because he's two to three times the price of the sellers who just ship them directly from Japan. Or it could be worse. You could have the specialty that only one person in a hundred thousand would care about. What if you make replacement interior parts for the Ford Pinto? How many Ford Pintos are still out there? But the ones that are out there, how many are getting new interior parts? Whenever I see one, it's a drag car. It's never just driving on the street. And you've got a lot of items that require a second item to function in the first place. And this is really where, where you, the phrase install base comes into mind. Because, you know... The number of those items that are installed are going to limit the people who can buy your item. Sometimes it's enough to be unlimited. You're not going to run out of customers who have a current generation iPhone, even a 1960s Camaro. You know, the number of people who own dogs is effectively unlimited. The number of PlayStation 5 owners at the moment is effectively unlimited. People who have ovens or bicycles or other common items you're generally unlimited in that category, so you can safely sell items that require owning one of those things just fine. I mean, not everyone's going to own a dog, or a bicycle, or a 67 Camaro, but enough people are going to that your items can sell. But a lot of other items have much smaller installation bases, or many of them have large installation bases, but ones that are in continual and serious decline. Now, when it comes to auto parts, for example, there are quite a few cars that have really large populations despite their age, and these populations are not going down. 
if anything, they're going up as more hulks and frames and junkyard things are brought back to life and examples are being built up from nothing at all. That's possible with quite a few vehicles now that you can build them up from absolutely nothing because you can buy the shell or the frame and every single piece for the vehicle. Uh, things like your Model T, your Model A and 32 Fords, your 55, 57 Chevy, your Chevy trucks from the mid 60s through the through the late 80s, your air-cooled Volkswagen, 60s Mustangs, Camaros, your 80s Mustangs, all Corvettes, your SL Mercedes. I'm sure I missed a bunch of them, but parts for these vehicles are going to be in demand, and they will continue to have demand. However, what if you got parts for an 82 Subaru? If you got parts for a Mitsubishi or a Zuzu Mini truck, or any other examples of one of those, oh man, I haven't seen one of those in 25 years, cars. Those parts could be sitting in your basement for decades, unless you've got that one part that always breaks on the car. In the case of the Mitsubishi slash Dodge Mini Trucks, it's the uh, the grill because they were super brittle. They're plastic and they were super brittle when brand new. And now that they're 40 years old, they're even more brittle. Or it could be the parts are completely unsellable because the vehicle in question is nearly extinct. Good luck selling parts specific to an 86 Hyundai Excel. I don't know if there are any of them left that are licensed. Or... Maybe you've got board game parts or vacuum replacement parts. Uh, you need people to both own that board game or that vacuum and care to complete it or fix it. In fact, there's entire broad categories, specifically of media, that are now limited by a continually shrinking install bases. And these install bases are much smaller than most sellers require. Did you know that even six years ago, less than half of all homes even had a DVD or a Blu-ray player? And those numbers continually go down every single year. And the install bases of things like VHS players, tape decks, and CD players that aren't in cars are, are much smaller than you think. Do they put CD players in cars anymore? I I'm really not sure. I've never been in a new car, so I don't know. I think record players are the only media player that has an expanding install base. However, that trend is going to flatten out or reverse once the older generation who never stopped listening to records dies off. At that point you're only going to have the newer generation who picked it up as a novelty. And that trend could also die as well. Uh, once they stop selling Oh, sorry. Once they stop manufacturing a game console, the number of working consoles out there is going to start a continuous decline. And it's very rapid nowadays. While the games themselves rarely fail, so the games stick around forever. And it seems the newer the console, the higher the failure rate is. Like your old cartridge-based systems, your Nintendo and your Sega Genesis, your Nintendo 64, they have relatively low failure rates and they're fairly repairable. Uh, the fi once they started to use CDs though, you know, your Sega CD and your PlayStation 1, much higher failure rate. Then once they started putting hard drives in them, the failure rate went up even higher. And that's where it is today. The failure rate on modern consoles is incredibly high, and they continue to fail more and more each year. And only a tiny fraction of those broken ones are ever actually repaired. Many of them fail in ways that uh, nobody but a true electronics genius could repair in the first place, and their time isn't worth the value of the console. You know, like if you've got bad RAM in a PlayStation 4, you know who's going to be able to figure that out? Somebody who's t and re replace it. Somebody whose time isn't worth working on a PlayStation 4. So you might not want to be stockpiling excessive amounts of merchandise for something with a small or declining install base. You know, you might get the deal of the century and get a hundred brand new molded carpet sets for the 80 to 88 Ford Escort. You might only pay five dollars each for them, and that's a three hundred and fifty dollar MSRP item. But then you find out that you're stuck because you list them. After 11 months, you sell your first one. You going to hold on to these for the next 100 years and hope more people want to put new carpet in those 80s escorts? In fact, unless you've got unlimited free space, and if you have unlimited free space, there's an easier way to work money, make money, you rent your free space. You don't even have to sell anything.
I've been having too much supply of any single item ends up being a liability, not an asset. Sure, you might have 40 years left to live, but do you want a 40 year supply of duct polishing kits taking up half of your basement in space that you could be using for inventory that you could move sooner or just living space or just running around naked flapping your wing space? Yeah, think about it. Uh, let's t pause here, take a look at some sales, and maybe I can ramble on about something that makes a little more sense after I get back. All right, let's do some sales here. I'm doing it from <clears throat> my desk because my wife has stacked up about 10 loads of laundry in front of the bar, and I can't get to it. For some reason, we can't get laundry done at our house. I offer to do all of it if it will just be brought down one load at a time because there's no place to put more than one load at a time but somehow that never happens instead it gets brought down 10 loads at a time after everything that my wife and daughter owns is dirty okay look at the sales i sold five gans cheerful snowman ornaments same customer for 4.99 each still gonna put the names on those sold a couple of uh snapback hats the USS Thomas Gates, 1939, and the Dwight D. Eisenhower, 1637. Different customers, same day. This sold in less than a week. A classic Wilson uh, dual tennis bag sold for $20. That's a Goodwill outlet find. For some reason, everybody leaves the sports bags alone at my Goodwill outlet. Even the sports guys. Big Game Board Hunt from 1967, incomplete, sold for $26.56. This took about two years to sell because it was incomplete. Neopets, uh, two-player starter deck, $16.49. I believe I got, the, I got this in a bulk purchase from the collector store at their old location when they were getting ready to move. And it sat behind my bar as a decoration for years. A Ford uh, body mod absorber, $15. This was in the store for three days. Good little outlet find. Three Pinnacle Savage Worlds maps and terrain kits. All the same customer, $16.29 total plus shipping. At that price, I almost should have kept those. Now, this thing I got at the Good Outlet, it's Tucker the Talking Truck Bot. It sold for $40 in about three weeks. This severely resembles, to my mind, one of the mini bosses in Mega Man 2 and Dr. Wily's Castle. Let's see if I can put a picture up and see how close my memory is of that. Probably way off. We'll see. I sold some Funko Pops. I sold a lot of three Funko Pops, all related to Bindi in the ink machine. They were only up for about three or four days because I priced them lower, and the cu customer who ended up purchasing was very desperate to purchase them, was sending me lowball offers right away, and finally after he got my 10% off offer, he asked me to come down a little bit more, and I did. I think he paid either 20 or 22. I don't know because I'd have to click through the order because it is partially refunded. Title Legends for the PlayStation 2, $9.71. If you ever wanted to play Rainbow Islands or Bubble Bobble on your PlayStation 2, here's your chance. And a whole bunch of others that you probably don't want to play. All right, that's all the sales for today, at least all the ones we're going to show. Oh man, have I ever told you how great Pokemon customers are? How I love all those Timmies. I want to pat each one of them on the head and give them a cookie and a hug and send them out the door into the wonderful world. Well, today I was contacted by Pokemon customers on both of my accounts. Uh, one of the Timmies was upset that his $2.99 Pokemon card, available for $0.40 cents on TCG Player, had a printer dot defect on it. And it wouldn't grade a PSA 10. It won't grade a PSA 10 with a printer dot defect. The level of magical thinking and lack of knowledge there would put most cult members to shame. First off, Timmy, like many of my Pokemon customers, mysteriously buys a card off me for $3 when it's available for $0.40 cents elsewhere. That's not my fault. All of my cards in my card account are $2.99. 
and I expect fluctuating prices to constantly be bringing some of the stock up to the value, to that value at which point those items sell. I didn't make him buy that for me. Second, he bought it from a multi-quantity listing that had a large amount available and a large amount sold. In fact, this, this card was worth about two bucks back during the COVID days, and I used to have a $2 minimum, so I sold quite a few of it back then. And he was, for some reason, in this quantity listing, was expecting to get this exact same one in the photo. Third, Timmy here was going to spend about $20 total, if not more, to grade a worthless card. I believe it's $12 to grade worthless cards, plus you got to ship it each way. Fourth, he was expecting this card to get a 10. Most cards directly out of the pack are going to grade a 7 to a 9. Especially things like Pokemon, shiny Pokemon cards. They'll tend to have weird speckly things on the edges and other defects. Like, I'm looking at this one. I can tell that this isn't a 10 just by looking at it because the centering on the back isn't perfect. And the final icing on the cake was that a PSA 9 example of this card sold on eBay yesterday for the opening bid of one penny plus the $5.99 shipping. 100% of this card's value is in the labor it takes me to put it into the envelope. The card itself is worthless. Ugh. Then later in the day, Timmy number two messages me. He bought a sealed bo booster box of Pokemon cards from me and insists that the booster box is fake. There's no way for me to fight that. What are you going to do? Say no it isn't? Timmy already filed the INAD. So I assume I'm going to get my box returned stuffed full of fake cards that Timmy ordered from Alibaba. Now he said he only ordered to open two of the packs, so I'm probably going to get it back stuffed with fake packs from Alibaba and maybe a couple of fake cards. I don't know. Either way, I'm out the box and shipping both ways. And the reason I just didn't hand it to him is because maybe he never thought it was fake in the... F because, ah. Maybe he's wrong, and maybe he'll actually send it back. Or maybe he won't send it back. I don't know. But either way, I'm making him send it back. Speaking of making it, you've made it this far. Can you hit subscribe? It's not going to give me that $130 box back from Timmy, but at least it's going to let me feel good about a number, because I don't feel good about that $130 number. Hey, in the good news, I'm starting to get a lot more mobile than I was. I'm getting used to walking again. I'm getting out of the house multiple times a week. Been out to quite a few garage sales recently. Still no garage sale footage. I just don't film it. Don't even try to film at sales. I'll do some haul videos now and then, but not every time. And... I went over my finances year to date and I found one happy Easter egg hidden among what has otherwise been my financially worst reselling year ever. All I'm going to have to do to literally not have to pay any federal taxes this year other than self-employment is to move some money out of savings to max out both my IRA and my wife's IRA for the year. That between the business expenses, standard deduction, my dependent daughter, and the $13,000 deductions for Taking the, for maxing those IRAs out, will take the rest of my income down to zero. That should result in a massive tax return, as I paid full price for my marketplace insurance all year. So I should be getting that probably every dime of that back. And my wife, every dime my wife paid in federal, plus there's that child tax credit, that's a couple thousand dollars. I'll be getting all that back as well. That should allow me to maximize both our IRAs next year. And I had been worrying, trying to figure out how to claim that prosthetic leg as a business expense. Uh, people were, people including tax people went both ways on it. My prosthetic guy seemed to be bullish on it because apparently other people have done so. But now I'm not even going to have to because I'm not going to, I'm going to go to zero without having to claim it. Uh and next, this isn't really reselling advice so much as life advice, but pay that house off. Pay everything off. Maximize your IRA contributions every year. The younger you are, the more effect that's going to have. It's going to help you ride out those bad years and finally stop working all together. All right, that's all I got for today. Thanks, and I hope to see you again soon. See, that's, that's one-foot flippers nonsense video. About